The formation and creation of magnetic fields is a massive scientific area in accelerator physics and technology, and the measurement of magnetic fields is an entire section within the science. Almost inevitably, when creating a circular accelerator, the magnetic field gets measured and the electric one does not. Why is that? Because the requirements for magnetic fields are stricter than for electric fields. It is responsible for the form of the orbit and the beam size. There are two types of magnets that are considered to be fundamental in the selection of magnets that an engineer chooses from when designing a circular accelerator. Dipole and quadrupole magnets. The backbone of an accelerator is the consecutive placement of these magnets along the ideal shape of the circular orbit, creating the linear optics. We can safely say that the magnet production quality and their parameters are the key determinants of the successful operation of a circular accelerator. From the name, it is understood that the magnetic field is the main characteristic of any magnet. The magnetic field of circular accelerators is measured in the area of the beam span in the direction of its movement. In this manner, integral characteristics are measured. These characteristics are experienced by the beam during circulation inside an accelerator. During the measurement and assessment of the fields of circular accelerator magnets, Fourier analysis is used. This means the field is divided into a main and an additional component known as harmonics. Harmonics may be allowed and not allowed. Allowed harmonics are normally found in the field decay of any magnet. They show, so to speak, the quality and working effectiveness of the engineer who developed this magnet. The smaller these harmonics are, the smaller the difference of the main field of the magnet from an ideal one. For every type of magnet, there exists a set of allowed harmonics. It characterizes the pole symmetry type of the magnet. Not allowed harmonics are a consequence of the violation of the pole symmetry. They reflect the production or assembly inaccuracies of the magnet. The central philosophy of testing any superconducting magnet is the verification of its characteristics in the conditions under which it will work as part of an accelerator ring. However, we perform the first magnet measurements of the nucleotron type not at helium temperature as it should be, but rather at ambient temperature, with the excitation current of the magnet a hundred times lower than nominal. This is the section where warm magnetic measurements are taken. Here, the magnetic field is measured at ambient temperature. The objective of these measurements is to confirm the correctness of the yoke and superconducting winding assembly. If something is not done in accordance with the blueprints, it will be evident right away by the presence of not allowed harmonics in the Fourier analysis of the magnetic field. The sensor used to measure the system of rotating coils is exactly the same as the one that will be used in the cryostat at the cryogenic testing stand. There are several basic ways to measure a magnetic field in circular accelerator magnets. So far, all of them have been highly developed and well detailed in technical literature. For the nucleotron type magnets, we use the rotating harmonic coil method where the coils of a certain configuration rotate inside the working magnet aperture, and a special EMF signal is analyzed which is located in these coils during rotation. After the level of perfection of the superconducting winding and iron yoke has been confirmed by the results of the warm measurements, the magnet returns to the mechanical area. Its final assembly takes place. All helium tubes are combined into a whole system. 
insulators are soldered in, potential end pins are soldered on, and helium collectors are installed. After all helium tubes have been soldered in a single system, in the tubes with circulating refrigerant coolant, an air tightness check takes place. Following the reinspection of the electric characteristics of the winding, the magnet is balanced on a special suspension inside the cryostat. And, after the installation of thermometers, it is ready for primary testing, for cooling and measuring the parameters under liquid helium temperature. But before we start talking about that, let's zero in on the cryostat structure of the nucleotron type magnet. There is a specific requirement for utilizing the remarkable properties of superconductivity, namely, the magnet temperature has to be maintained at 4.5 degrees Kelvin during operation. The casing that separates the magnet from the environment is the cryostat. The cryostat of the nucleotron magnet consists of a vacuum housing, a nitrogen screen and suspension elements. Inside the vacuum housing, there is an insulating vacuum with a pressure of one millionth of a pascal. The nitrogen screen is designed to reduce the influx of heat to the magnet's yoke from the surrounding space by means of radiation. When it is used, the transition from ambient temperature to helium temperature, at which the magnet works, is carried out in two phases. Thus, the heat gain of the magnet is decreased by an order of magnitude due to radiation. The tasks of cryogenic testing also includes a leakage check of the helium tubes, magnet training, measurement of the magnetic field characteristics, and measurement of the static heat gain and dynamic heat liberation during operation in a standard cycle. Let's discuss each of these points in more detail. The name leakage check of helium tubes speaks for itself. All the channels through which helium circulates during the operation of the accelerator must certainly be airtight. Why should one perform another check in cold conditions when the air tightness has already been checked at ambient temperature? Simply put, the geometrical dimensions of all superconducting magnet parts change during cooling. That is why micro fissures, which were closed at room temperature, may open up in cold temperatures. The vacuum density check of the helium tubes takes place at a special stand. The entire magnet is placed in this volume, and its tubes are fed with helium under pressure. It is followed by pumping gas out of the external volume to create a vacuum, and by reading the analyzer indications of the pumped gas, one makes a conclusion regarding the air tightness of the helium tubes of a magnet. If there is any leakage, then the helium from the circulation channels leaks into the common volume, and the leak seeker detects it. In this way, a conclusion about the air tightness of the cooling channels of the given magnet can be made. Before we discuss the magnet training, let's revisit the operation particularities of any superconducting element. Under certain conditions, any superconductor may go into a normal state. What happens in this case, and how does it happen? A small quantity of heat is generated at some place inside the superconductor. And here, the conductor loses its superconducting ability. It reaches the so-called normal conductivity state. Also, at this very point, dual heating begins, and the heating process and transition into a normal state exponentially spreads throughout the entire superconductor, throughout the whole superconducting winding. In the meantime, during a very short period of time measured by fractions of seconds, an enormous quantity of heat is generated in the magnet. This process needs to be avoided, because the magnet may simply self-destruct. In case of a disruption or transition of the magnet into a normal state, one needs to switch off the electric power supply and release the energy stored in the electromagnet. 
Training of the superconducting magnet is a process during which parts of its superconducting coil, which are under mechanical stress after the production process, are relaxed. A micro-shift of these parts, relative to each other, lead to local heat release, which causes the quench process in the whole superconducting coil. When mechanical stress is removed, micro-movement of the winding structure occurs and the magnet goes into a normal state. Therefore, nominal current operation is not achieved right away by any superconducting magnet, but rather in several steps. This process of gradual current increase and of achieving the nominal value is called training. In this event, current cycles with increasing amplitude are led to this magnet. The magnet may undergo one to several dozen transitions during the training. Now we are at the cryogenic testing stand. The facility next to me helps to cool the magnet and check its characteristics in the precise conditions that it will be working under in the accelerator ring. The satellite refrigerator and the current conducting cryostat make it possible to carry out magnet training, to alter magnetic field characteristics, to measure static heat input and dynamic heat release in the magnet while operating in the standard cycle, as well as to conduct a search for cold leakages. It takes about 40 hours to cool off the magnet. Measurements within the whole cryogenic testing program lasts for a few hours. During the next 24 hours, the magnet heating will take place. In summary, the entire testing cycle takes several workdays.